Hi, I'm Tom, coming to you from the internationally acclaimed Sourdough Baking Institute of Cleveland, Ohio, also known as my kitchen. Thank you for selecting my video. In today's video, we will be tackling one of the most complex challenges for beginning sourdough bakers, and that is understanding when is bulk fermentation done. This is like finding the end of the rainbow. It's like the search for the Holy Grail. It's trying to find that spot right when your bulk fermentation is not underproofed and it's not overproofed, but it's perfectly fully proofed. Even for experienced sourdough bakers, this is a challenge that takes many years of experience to develop. I've been baking for about 10 months and I've been chronicling my experience and my sourdough journey through these videos. And what I'm gonna to do today is share with you the techniques that I've learned over that period for determining when bulk fermentation is done. Now people develop this skill over time, but for beginning bakers, when you're only baking a loaf once a week, once every two weeks, one week it's overproof, the next week it's underproof, the third week your room temperature is different, the fourth week you try a different type of flour. So it's very difficult to learn these techniques when you bake infrequently. So what I'll try to do today is accelerate your learning and teach you what I've picked up along the way, all the techniques for assessing when I think bulk fermentation is done. So in today's experiment, we will be baking four loaves of bread to assess when do we think bulk fermentation is done. To do this, I will cut off one loaf intentionally early to show what an underproof loaf looks like. I will let one loaf go beyond what I think is the end point of bulk fermentation to show what an overproofed loaf looks like. And then I'll have two tries in the middle to try to hit exactly that end point of when I think bulk fermentation is perfectly finished. Now at this point, you might be saying to yourself, this guy's an experienced baker, you're a beginner. I mean, he's the curator of the internationally acclaimed Sourdough Baking Institute of Cleveland, Ohio. He probably can just look at a loaf and know immediately if it's overproofed or underproofed. I really can't. And, and today in particular, it's going to be exceptionally challenging because I'm using a new starter that I just developed. So I really don't know how this starter will behave and I'm using some new flour that I've never used before. So this is really a good challenge for me to change up my environment, and I'll tell you exactly what I'm looking for to determine all through the process if I believe this loaf is underproofed or overproofed along the way. Now I've already created some other videos on this topic that you might wanna consider if you haven't watched those yet. The first one is called The Mystery of Bulk Fermentation, this is where I go through in great detail all the elements that influence bulk fermentation. That's a great video to start with and that's very popular. The second video is called Underproofed or Overproofed, A Tale of Four Loaves. In that video, I bake four loaves of bread where I vary both the bulk fermentation time and the final proofing time. That's a very interesting video, but I'm changing two variables at the same time. I also have a video called Bulk Fermentation, The Impact on Open Crumb. This really looks at the handling techniques and the types of things that you do during bulk fermentation that can impact how your crumb ultimately looks based on handling. And then I recently created a video called Bulk Fermentation, Mastering Temperature and Time. This is a very valuable and detailed video that goes through a lot of the techniques that I'll use today where I'm controlling the temperature of my dough throughout the bulk fermentation process. And that video explains in great detail how temperature influences bulk fermentation time. We'll cover a little bit of that today, but not in as much detail as that video. You might wanna check out some of those videos first. But again, in today's video, we're gonna hold all the variables constant except for the bulk fermentation time. That's the only thing that I'll be varying here. Now, some of my other videos, if you watch them, are very long. As Mark Twain once said, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long letter. In today's video, I'm really going to try to compress things down, speed things up, and get through this a little bit more quickly than I typically do. So I'm not going to show every detailed step along the way. I'll show the steps that I believe are germane to the outcome of the bulk fermentation. But if you really want to learn the detailed steps of this process that I'm following, I recommend watching one of those other longer videos.
So if you've seen my other videos, you can probably guess which recipe we're using today. I follow Chad Robertson's Basic Country Loaf Recipe from the Tartine Bread Book. You can also find that recipe on the Tartine Bakery website. It's a basic recipe that a lot of people are familiar with. I follow it in all of these experimental videos so we have a consistent baseline across all of them. Here are the basics of this recipe. <clears throat> I use 1,000 grams of flour. It's a mix of 90% bread flour, 10% whole wheat flour. We mix that with 20% leaven, 75% water, and 2% salt. That's using the baker's percentages off that 1,000 grams of flour. After we mix the dough, we do a 40-minute what's called an auto lease, but it's actually a ferment lease because it includes the starter, the flour, and the water. That sits for 40 minutes. Then we add the salt. We let it rest for 30 minutes. And then we start a series of stretch and folds. Somewhere between four and six are the recommended number of stretch and folds during bulk fermentation. And then this recipe calls for two unique things that will definitely impact the outcome of this process. One is it recommends a relatively warm bulk fermentation temperature of 78 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the recommended internal dough temperature. That's 25.5 to 28 degrees Celsius. So I'll be using a proofing chamber to keep my dough at that temperature. The second unique thing about this recipe is that it calls for a relatively low percent rise in the dough in bulk fermentation. It calls for the end of bulk fermentation when the dough is between a 20 to 30% rise, which is relatively low compared to what you'll see in some other recipes. I'll talk about that in this process and I'll talk about why that occurs and what options you have as you're watching this dough approaching that 20 to 30% rise and what to look for to determine if you believe it's done at that time. Some other recipes call for a much higher percent rise in the dough, some calling for a 50% increase in volume, some calling for a doubling in the volume of the dough. Each recipe is very specific to the ingredients, the amount of starter, the temperature that you're fermenting the dough at, and the steps that happen after bulk fermentation. So this specific recipe uses that specific percent rise. If you're a beginner, I recommend selecting recipes that give you a recommended percent rise in the dough, recommended time for bulk fermentation, and most importantly, the recommended temperature that goes with those other two variables because those three things are inextricably linked in bulk fermentation. A recipe for beginners should provide at least two of those three, preferably all three of those. Otherwise, you'll just do a lot of guessing when you're starting off in this process and trying to guess at when bulk fermentation is done. That at least gives you a couple of variables to use to dial in that end point of bulk fermentation. Let's talk about the criteria that we use to determine whether bulk fermentation is done. So these are the things that I look at. First, I look at the recipe and I look at what was the guidance that the recipe gave in terms of temperature, time, and the percent rise. Those are the easiest things to measure. We want the temperature to be between 78 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 25.5 to 28 degrees Celsius. The time recommended is three to four hours after adding the salt. So I'll be looking at where do I sit in that window recommended to the time, which is inextricably linked to the temperature. If my temperature was outside of that recommended range, the time would be out of the recommended range. So I always look at time and temperature together. And then I also look for the percent rise, which is estimated to be from 20 to 30%. Those are real objective variables that for this recipe work extremely well. Then once we take the dough out of the proofing chamber, then I really want to observe the dough a couple of ways. One is we're going to look at the dough to do a window pane test. The window pane test is where you stretch the dough, you try to stretch it as thin as possible and see if you can get a real translucent, super thin layer of dough. That implies that you have sufficient gluten development in bulk fermentation, and that's a good test to know whether the dough is fully developed enough to end bulk fermentation. The other thing I look for is visual signs of fermentation activity on the dough. So on the top of the dough, you should see the dough domed up on the top. You should see some large irregular bubbles around the top of the dough. And if you lift, lift up the vessel and look around the sides of it, you should see air bubbles around the side of your bowl, indicating that there's a lot of air and a lot of fermentation activity happening inside the dough. In addition to that, I also like to shake the bowl, and I'll show an example of this. 
and this really just comes with experience, but you'll get a feel for how much the dough should shake or wobble. I call that the wobble test when it's done with bulk fermentation. You almost wanna see it shaking as if it's jello or even more liquidy than jello, where it almost looks like if it were liquefied, it would be splashing outside of the bowl. It should really be moving on the top portion of the dough pretty significantly. So those are the things that I look for in the dough. I'll do all those tests for each of the four loaves coming out of bulk fermentation. Now in this video, in the interest of time, I will not be showing all the steps in the process until we get closer to the end of bulk fermentation. But I followed all the steps by the book using the tartine bread basic country loaf recipe. So what I've done here is I did the fermentalise. I mixed the flour, the water, the starter, let that sit for 40 minutes, then added the salt, let that sit for 30 minutes. I did four rounds of stretch and folds with 30 minute intervals on the one mass of dough. Then I split this into four separate bowls of equal weight, and that's where we'll pick up the video here. Now I'm doing a fifth stretch and fold on the individual loaves. I'll do this for the other three as well. So it's been three hours and 15 minutes since I added the salt. This is loaf number one. It's been about four hours since we did that fermentalise where we added the ingredients, starter water and flour. Now the guidance in the recipe recommends after adding the salt, you should bulk ferment for about three to four hours. So I'm within that window. So now I want to start checking this to see, do I have evidence that bulk fermentation is done? A couple things that I'll look for. One is I want to see if I can pull a window pane on this. Now this flour that I'm using, the whole wheat flour, is a medium grind. So there's actually a lot of bran in here. I can actually see it. And those bran pieces actually work like little knives and they'll cut through the dough when you try to pull a window pane. So I typically won't get a great window pane with that much whole grain. So I can see there's some translucency here, but it really is ripping easily. So I have some gluten development, as I can see as I'm pulling that up, but that's not a fantastic window pane. But I'm attributing some of that to that different whole wheat flour that I'm using. The second thing that I'm looking for is some bubbles forming on the top, which before I pulled the window pane, I could see a few bubbles, but not a lot. Are there bubbles forming around the outside? I see a few, but not a lot. If I shake the dough, it has some pretty good movement to it that indicates it's got some good aeration. So that shake test actually looks pretty good. And then I look for the percent rise. So I'm right at the 375 milliliter mark against the edge where I started. It's domed up in the middle. It's very tough to call that to say if it's risen by 20%. Based on my experience, this dough does not look like it's ready. But as a beginner, this is where you kind of tell lies to yourself and say, uh, it kind of looked like a window pane, but maybe the whole grain was ripping the window pane. It's supposed to have bubbles on the top. I saw one or two. It's supposed to have risen 20%. I can't really tell if it's 20, but it's risen a little bit, so maybe it's 20. And then this is where you say, the guidance says three to four hours. I'm at three hours and 15 minutes. It recommends a dough temperature of 78 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm right at 80 degrees in the middle of the road. So this should be good to go using those variables. This is where it's very tough to call. Based on my experience, what I'm seeing here, this looks like it's not ready because it's not aerated enough. But I'm gonna move forward, because that's what a beginner would do. And as I pull it out of the bowl, I also look for gluten strands, and I'm not seeing a lot of individual gluten strands. Sometimes you'll see a real web of dough coming out of the bowl. I'm just seeing kind of a clump of dough. 
I am seeing some bubbles here. So this is not horrible, but this is the earliest possible that I would want to pull this dough out of bulk fermentation. So let's use this as our bookend of the earliest possible, three hours and 15 minutes after we added the salt, roughly four hours from the very start at 80 degrees Fahrenheit pretty consistently, which is 27 degrees Celsius. I put this onto an unflowered work surface and then I'm going to do pre-shaping, let this sit for a 30 minute bench rest and then final shaping. So to pre-shape this loaf, I don't have to do a lot because I already divided this, so it's already somewhat in the shape of a boule. I'm just gonna fold this up on top of itself to try to get some height. And that dough feels a little stiff to me. So I fold that up on itself. Now I'm just gonna flip it over. And very carefully try to get this into a round shape. I don't need to do too much. There it is. That's all I'm doing for pre-shaping. Very lightly flour the top. Now I look at that dough and it's definitely standing up off the countertop. It's clearly not overproofed, not even close. I can't really tell if it's underproofed or not. It kind of looks like it is, but I'm not going to jump to conclusions. I'm going to let that sit for 30 minutes. So this is loaf number one. It's been sitting here after pre-shaping for 30 minutes. I just lightly dusted the top of this with flour. Now this is where it's important to understand why the tartine recipe calls off bulk fermentation at 20 to 30% rise in the dough it's because this dough temperature is still at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So even though I officially said bulk fermentation ended 30 minutes ago, the yeast doesn't know. The yeast is still sitting here in this 80 degree bath fermenting away. So this is continuing to ferment. And then once I shape it and put it into the refrigerator, it'll continue to ferment even longer. Here's a chart that's really helpful to understand when we do a cold retard and we put the loaves into the refrigerator. Let me put this up on the screen. This shows that this was from a bake I did a couple of weeks ago where I put a continuous probe thermometer into a loaf and then put it into the refrigerator and monitored the temperature. It went into the refrigerator at 78 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 25.6 degrees Celsius. It took three and a half hours for that loaf to get down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's still fermenting once it goes into the refrigerator. And then finally it cools down. It took 10 hours for the loaf to actually get to refrigerator temperature. Now we often think when you put a loaf into the refrigerator, it immediately goes to the refrigerator temperature. It does not. It just slows down the fermentation process. That's why it's called a cold retard. Retard means slow down. So when you think about when is bulk fermentation done, that's really an arbitrary point where I decided bulk fermentation is done. The yeast doesn't know fermentation is done yet. It's still going. I can keep telling it, bulk fermentation's done. It's in pre-shaping now. You're going to go into cold retard. The dough doesn't listen to me. It just knows the temperature and the temperature keeps fermenting. It's still fermenting before my eyes. So let's shape it. So yeah, this feels a little under proof to me. Just based on the dough, it feels stiff. It's not as bubbly and airy as I would expect. When I try to pull it apart here, you can see it's just kind of a big slab of dough that doesn't want to stretch very much. It's not horrible, but it's definitely early. But this is how we learn. So I'm going to do a very simple, simple batard shape on these. Because these are such small loaves, I can't do the classic tartine trifold and then the roll up. There's just not enough dough to work with. So I do a real simplified version here where I just fold this side over. I fold this side over. I lightly degas that down the middle to make sure that I don't have air bubbles in there. And then I roll this towards me, kind of stretching to the sides as I'm turning it towards me, stretch. And there I get my batard. Then I just tuck the ends in I pinch those ends down because I really want an airtight seal. 
And then after I get that sealed up, I add a little bit more flour. You don't want to add a lot of flour to this because the flour will create weak seams inside the loaf. So I'm really careful about not using any more flour than I need to. Now, as I rolled that up, you can see that loaf has some bubbles in it. So this is still fermenting. As I said, this is incredibly active right now. It's going to go into the refrigerator, still very fermentally active, if that's a word, fermentally. I think I just made that up. There's my loaf. Now, another thing you can check to see the state of proofing of your loaf after you're coming out of bulk fermentation is I shake the loaf in the pan. See how the whole loaf is shaking kind of front to back. It's opening up a gap at each end of the pan. That means that it's leaning more towards underproofing than overproofing when you see the whole loaf rocking like that. When you put an overproofed loaf in the pan, you'll see the loaf kind of sit there and just the top portion of the dough will be jiggling. This whole loaf is rocking. You can see that rocking motion that's leaning towards underproofing. We'll see. Maybe I'll be surprised. Like I said, I haven't worked with this dough before with this flour and I'm using a brand new starter. So we'll see how good my estimation is. This goes into the refrigerator for an overnight cold retard. These will go for quite a long time, probably 15 hours before I bake these up. The recipe calls for eight to 12 hours. You don't get a material difference in the fermentation after you get past about that 10 to 12 hour mark, because as I indicated at that point, the temperature is down to refrigerator temperature, which is about 37 degrees. That completes, completely shuts down the yeast activity at that point, and it really slows down the lactic acid bacteria. So I'll let these go until morning and then we'll bake it up. Loaf number two has gone for four hours since we added the salt. So that's four hours and 40 minutes since we initially mixed the flour, the water, and the leaven. So this went 45 minutes longer than loaf number one. This looks very different than loaf number one. I can tell just looking at it right now. It's much more domed up on the top. I can see some large bubbles forming here on the top. It's a smoother looking surface. I look at the sides, tremendously much more uh, bubble activity around the sides of this bowl. So much more active from a fermentation perspective. And from a percent rise, it's slightly above that 375 milliliter mark where we started. So it's risen more than loaf one. I would approximate that maybe at 20%, not more than 20% rise. It's difficult to tell in the bowl because it's domed up on the top, but let's call that one a 20% rise, four hours bulk fermentation, according to the guidance in the recipe of three to four hours after adding the salt. So this looks closer to when I would typically cut off bulk fermentation. If I shake the bowl, it looks a little bit more active than loaf number one, a little looser, a little bit more air. Let's do a window pane test on this one and see if it looks any different than loaf number one. So that does, I'm getting a much better stretch. Look at that compared to loaf number one, which was ripping much more quickly. That's pretty good gluten development there. It's still ripping due to the whole grains in the loaf, but that's a better window pane than I had on loaf number one. So when I compare these two to each other, loaf number two is definitely looking better in terms of all the indications of when bulk fermentation should be done compared to loaf number one. I still don't know if this is fully proofed because it's just barely at that 20% rise mark. So this might still be a little bit under. As I take it out of the bowl, I look for individual gluten strands and I do see those in the bottom of the bowl. You start to see these little webs sticking to the side of the bowl. That's a sign that you have good gluten development. And when I put that on the countertop, I look at how high is it sitting up on the countertop. It's sitting up very proudly, which means it's definitely not overproofed or it would really flatten out and look a little bit more liquidy and stringy. That dough actually looks pretty good and pretty close to what I would normally call at the end of bulk fermentation. I'm just going to do a very basic pre-shape like I did on the other. Just fold this over on itself. Now this is a taller loaf. I can tell just from feeling it. There's more air in this than there was in loaf number one. I'm getting a taller build up there on my pre-shaping. 
And then I just very carefully shape that into a round and build a little bit of surface tension. I find that when I really overdo the pre-shaping, it causes a lot of irregularity in the crumb and sometimes does more harm than good. Because I'm not dividing this from a larger mass of dough, I don't need to do a lot of pre-shaping because it's coming out of a bowl with quite a bit of structure to it already. So I go a little bit light. Now we let this sit for 30 minutes. I'll cover this and then we'll do final shaping. Loaf number two has been resting for 30 minutes. Time for final shaping. This loaf looks pretty good. It's still standing up nice and tall. I don't see a lot of bubble activity on the top of it. It doesn't look that dissimilar from loaf number one. It feels a little more airy than loaf number one. It's definitely a little fatter feeling sitting up off of the countertop. As I stretch that out, there's just more dough to go around because it has more air in it. So I'm getting a little better stretch. And then I'll just do that same tri-fold with the vitard roll. This dough is a little stickier, a little bit looser than loaf number one. That's a good looking loaf. Real nice firm loaf. <clears throat> we do the shake test. Very similar to loaf number one. You see the whole loaf rocking. It's definitely not overproofed. It looks a little bit more airy and fatter than loaf number one. So it looks a little bit further along. Not significantly different. This goes into the fridge for overnight cold retard. Loaf number three has bulk fermented for four and a half hours since we added the salt, a little over five hours since adding the leaven, flour, and water at the beginning of the fermentalis. This dough has risen about 30 to 35 percent based on my milliliter markers. Now this looks a little bit different than loaf number two. We don't have those individual bulging bubbles on the top. The whole thing is domed up, but it actually looks like it then it quieted down a little bit after that because it's just kind of domed and flat. If I jiggle it, it's pretty loose. I'd say pretty similar to loaf number two, maybe a little bit looser. When I look for bubble activities around the edge, I'm not seeing as much bubble activity. It looks like the bubbles formed and then collapsed. And then if we do a window pane test on this, really soft, supple dough, beautiful window pane on this one. But it's ripping a little bit earlier than loaf number two, but I got a really thin pull of a window pane on that as well. So this is definitely further along than loaf number two. I don't know if it's too far along. Let's dump it out. And I'm seeing that web of gluten strands coming off the bottom of the bowl, where I can also tell that it's further along. When it sits on the counter, you see how it's relaxing there a little bit more. It looks a little wetter, a little stringier but it's still really holding its height very well. I don't think this is overproofed at all, but it's a little further along than loaf number two. Let's do a basic pre-shaping on this. Same thing as before, I just stack it on itself. Just grab these corners. I'm really just trying to get height and surface tension. Now this loaf is loose. Like I can feel this loaf falling apart as I'm stacking it. I'm gonna go around one more time. Yeah, that is a loose loaf. When I flip it over, it feels loose. You don't want to overdo the pre-shaping, as I said before, just get some surface tension. It's very sticky and very stringy. So this one's definitely pushing more towards overproofing than not, but it's still standing up nicely. It has a lot of height. This one could be really perfect. We'll let that sit for 30 minutes and then do final shaping.
Now, as loaf number three is resting here, let's just talk about that difference between what I saw in loaf number three and loaf number two. Loaf number three clearly turned the corner towards overproofing versus underproofing, just in that 30 minute time difference between the two loaves. Let me put this example up on the screen. This is from one of my experiments I did in a prior video where I bulk fermented dough at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius. And this is showing the percent rise in the dough in 30 minute increments of bulk fermentation. Look at that last half hour from four and a half hours to five hours. We went from a 12% rise in the dough to 25% rise in the dough just in 30 minutes. So what you can see here is that in bulk fermentation, especially at warm temperatures like this 80 degree Fahrenheit, 82 degree Fahrenheit, roughly 27, 28 degrees Celsius, things can happen very quickly at the end. And bulk fermentation is not a linear climb through the percent rise in the dough. It's more of this hockey stick effect where it's kind of flat, flat, flat. And then in that last half hour, last hour, it just shoots up and that's where you get all the bulk fermentation activity. That's why it's easy to underproof a loaf by cutting it off just 30 minutes earlier because it hasn't turned on that rise yet. And it's easy to overproof a loaf because 30 minutes after it goes past its target, you're getting this really steep climb towards the top, which leads to overproofing. So this idea of bulk fermentation is really about catching the dough at exactly that sweet spot where it's not underproofed and it's not overproofed. These loaves are a good example of both sides of that spectrum. We'll see how they bake up. Loaf three has been resting for 30 minutes after pre-shaping. Let's do the final shaping. Now this loaf relaxed a little bit more. It looks a little flatter than the prior loaves, but not a lot. I'm just gonna very lightly dust the top of this. That dough feels pretty good. It still has a lot of structure to it. It's not sticky and stringy like an overproofed loaf would be. It's maintaining some cohesive shape as I stretch it here. It's a very soft loaf, a lot of air. Now this loaf has the most aeration. You can see all these bubbles bulging on the surface. That's not a bad thing. It just means that there's a lot of fermentation activity in there. That, that dough actually feels really airy. That could be a very nice loaf. But it's still maintaining its shape. When I put it in the shaping basket, that could be a really nice loaf. Shake it. Now here you can see it's rocking, but it's a little more jiggly. You see the top half of the dough actually moving kind of separately from the bottom of the dough. So that's a sig signal that you're starting to push the overproofing a little bit. The whole thing is not rocking as one cohesive unit. The top portion is wobbling. That loaf also smells a little bit more sour, which indicates it's getting further along with the proofing. We'll get that in the fridge for overnight cold retard. Loaf number four has finished with bulk fermentation. It's been in the proofing chamber for five hours. This is sitting at 82 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the high end of the range, 28 degrees Celsius. For five hours since we added the salt, five hours and 40 minutes since we mixed the fermentalis initially. Now this dough, is much more domed up and airier, has a few small bubbles on top, not the big bubbles that we saw. And this has risen about 50%. I have the milliliters marked on the side here on this piece of tape. I did a very precise measurement of the milliliters in this bowl using water to measure the volume before I put the dough in here. So this is up about 50%, very domed on the top. If I shake this, you can see it almost looks like if that were liquid, it would be splashing out of the bowl. That is a really loose, airy dough. Let's pull a window pane. This dough feels real thin to me, like it wants to break away quicker. I'm getting a decent window pane there. 
but the dough all around the edges where I'm holding on to it seems super thin like it wants to break. So this means that the gluten is starting to deteriorate slightly in here. You can see this is shiny and veiny looking, which is another indication. And as I pull it out of the bowl, I can see a lot of that webbing of the gluten strands coming out of the bowl. Let me see if I can show those at all on the camera. It's tough to see. It's just when it comes off the bottom of the bowl, you really see that webbiness. So when this sits on the counter, it's not bad. I mean, this is not flattening out like a bowl of starter. This is not significantly overproofed, but we're just pushing the continuum a little bit with each one of these loaves. But I think all four of these will be fine. You can see that loaf is still relaxing. It's not as stiff as loaves one or two. So let me just do my fold up here for pre-shaping. Similar to loaf three, this is really active. It wants to pull back from me. It's not really holding its shape as much, but that's not bad. It's just got a lot of air in it. That's standing up fairly nicely. Now you can see this dough is more sticky and it's breaking apart more easily. All indications that we're pushing overproofing, but not too bad. It's still holding shape really nicely. It's holding its height. That's not a bad loaf. We'll let that rest for 30 minutes and then do final shaping. Loaf four has sat for 30 minutes after pre-shaping. Let's do the final shaping on this loaf. This spread out a little bit like loaf number three. So I look at how that relaxes on the countertop. It's a little bit loose, but not horrible. I think all these loaves will bake up fine, but you'll see a different degree of proofing in all them for sure. This loaf is stickier. This loaf does not feel much different than loaf number three. Give this our shake test. Very similar to loaf three. Again, it, it's wobbling a little bit more on the top of the loaf than loaves one and two did. It's a little bit looser, a little bit airier, but not too bad. So I don't think any of these loaves appear to be severely overproofed in my opinion. I think we're gonna go from underproofed in loaf number one up to fully proofed plus here in loaf number four, but we'll see. It's hard to say until you bake it and cut it open. So it's day two, I have scored and baked all of the loaves. They all baked up very similarly in 35 to 37 minutes. The way that I bake these is I preheat the oven to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 260 degrees Celsius. With the Dutch oven in there preheating at that temperature, I put the loaves into the Dutch oven with the lid on. I reduce the temperature to 450 degrees, which is 232 degrees Celsius and bake them for 20 minutes with the lid on. Then I remove the lid for the last 15 or so minutes and I monitor them for doneness, continuing at 450 degrees Fahrenheit, 232 degrees Celsius. I generally bake these to about 210 to 212 degrees internal temperature, which is 100 degrees Celsius. Now, before we cut into these, let's look at the four loaves and see how they baked up see what we can determine from the exterior of the loaves. Now, just as a reminder, I'm gonna give the total bulk fermentation time starting from the time that I added the leaven to the flour and the water. This is considered the fermentalese process in the recipe up until the point where we did pre-shaping. 
So loaf number one, that time was four hours of what I'm calling bulk fermentation. Loaf number two, four and three quarter hours. Loaf number three, five and a quarter hours. Loaf number four, five and three quarter hours. So basically the difference between loaf one and two was 45 minutes and then 30 minutes and 30 minute differences between the other loaves in terms of bulk fermentation before we did pre-shaping. These were all pre-shaped, rested for 30 minutes on the countertop, final shaped, and then went into the refrigerator for a 15 hour cold retard. The refrigerator temperature and the loaf temperature the next morning was about 37 degrees Fahrenheit or three degrees Celsius. Let's look at loaf number one. So this was our shortest bulk fermentation time. This loaf really maintained its shape fairly nicely, but it's a little bit more compact loaf compared to the others. It just didn't open up quite as much as the other loaves did. We'll see how that one looks. That's not a bad looking loaf. Loaf number two, this one had tremendous oven spring. Just look how that one really bulged up on the top. But unfortunately, based on my experience, I've seen this before. And when you get this big belly on the loaf, this big bulge on the top of the loaf, this if I had to give this loaf a name, I would call this false hope. This looks like great oven spring, but normally when you see that big bulge like that, it means that the loaf is under fermented and you got a big gas bubble in there. Or I, in my shaping, I created a big gas bubble somehow. So I'm a little bit concerned about loaf number two based on what I'm seeing on the outside. Loaf number three, that's really a beautiful loaf, opened up nicely on the ear, kept its shape. We got very nice height, nice blistering on the side. That's really a very nice loaf all around. And then loaf number four, this one is interesting because it exploded a little bit more on the scoring. So this loaf might have had a little bit more gluten deterioration than loaf number three because it didn't quite hold its shape as well as loaf number three during the baking. So let's just look at these again from the top down. So what you see when you compare the four loaves from the top down is pretty much what you would expect that with less fermentation time, you have a more compact loaf because I didn't give the yeast as much time to aerate that loaf. And as you move to the right, you get a larger, a little bit more relaxed loaf over here on loaf number four. And you clearly see that progression as you move from left to right. The other interesting thing is that the ear opened up almost exactly the same way on all four of these loaves. So some people ask the question why they're not getting an ear, why their loaf isn't opening up on the scoring. It clearly doesn't have anything to do with proofing time or bulk fermentation time based on what I'm seeing here. These all opened up beautifully on the ear. And the other thing that I look at is how it opened up really on the scoring. This one opened up a little bit. This one opened up a little bit with the big belly that we talked about. This one opened up even more. You can see the gluten strands starting to tear here versus what I saw here and here. And in loaf number four, this opened up even wider. So you're getting a little bit less strength to your gluten structure as the loaf ferments longer and longer. And you can also see how here on loaf number four, this one actually flopped open over the side on the scoring here. It did not quite hold the scoring the way that loaf number three did. So as you move from left to right, the loaf is getting less strong in terms of the gluten structure being able to hold it together. Number one, very tight, very compact loaf, very tight gluten. Loaf number four, a little bit looser, a little bit more relaxed loaf with a little bit more stretched out gluten because the fermentation stretched it out a little bit more and the longer fermentation time starts to deteriorate the gluten in the longer fermented loaves. So let's cut into these and see what the crumb can tell us about each one of the loaves. This is what we call the moment of truth. It is time to cut into the loaves. Now all four of these loaves bulk fermented at a dough temperature of between 80 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly 27 to 28 degrees Celsius. The times that I'm giving, I'm giving here are from the time that we added the leaven to the flour and the water until we got to pre-shaping. So loaf number one fermented for four hours prior to pre-shaping. Let's cut into it and see how it looks. Mm -hmm. 
So this is a typical underproofed loaf. You can see that the crumb just did not open up. You see these areas of extremely dense crumb here in the loaf. It just didn't give the yeast enough time to do its work. So this loaf did not open up. It's kind of a classic underproofed, not horribly underproofed, but definitely on the underproofed end of the continuum. And that's expected because I cut this off early. This was just barely at 20% increase in volume in the dough. Uh, and I could tell when I was handling this that it was not fully aerated. It's not a horrible looking loaf, but it's definitely on the side of underproofing. Loaf number two fermented for four hours and 45 minutes. So this went 45 minutes longer than loaf number one. Let's see what difference that 45 minutes makes. So this loaf is much better. You can see this opened up much more and is much more aerated than loaf number one. But some people would call this a fool's crumb where I have these dense areas still in here that did not fully ferment. And then I have these larger gaps and holes around the top of the loaf. That is not a bad looking loaf at all, but it's not really a consistent fermentation of that loaf. And I'd call that slightly on the underside of uh, bulk fermentation. Now the reason you get these big air bubbles like this is because when this loaf went into the oven, the yeast had not fully exhausted all of its capability or all of its fermentation power. So when it hits the oven and it hits that last burst of warm temperature, this yeast goes crazy and it still had a lot of gas in the tank because we didn't let this fully proof during bulk fermentation. So this still had a little ways to go once it got into the oven and then you get these big explosions, these big gas bubbles here from a slightly un under fermented loaf. Loaf number three, so this went for five hours and 15 minutes, so 30 minutes longer than loaf number two, one hour and 15 minutes longer than loaf number one. Let's see what difference that made. Now that's really a beautiful loaf. So this is a nice looking crumb. You can see much more consistent opening up of the crumb here in the middle. I still have a very dense part right here in the center, and then these kind of gas bubbles around the edges. So this is a better proofed loaf, still not perfect. And then loaf number four, this was our longest bulk fermented loaf. This one went for five hours and 45 minutes. So this was one hour and 45 minutes longer than loaf number one, 30 minutes longer than the loaf we just cut into. Let's cut this one into it and see. Now this one is starting to push over proofing in my opinion. So now I'm getting a dense crumb on the other side of fully proofing where this basically aerated and then started to contract again. So I have this dense network of holes, but you can see there are more holes in here that opened up, but now they've contracted and become smaller. So this is a, I'd say fully proofed loaf, but just starting to push the edge of overproofing. So now I've sliced the four loaves so we can get a better picture of what's going on and I have four slices from each loaf in these four columns in front of me. Now here you can see a little bit better. Loaf number one, you can see this just didn't open up either in terms of size or in terms of aeration. You have this very dense part of the crumb here on all four of those slices. And then this air tunnel over here on the side, which is a sign of underproofing the big tunnels. Loaf number two is interesting because this really opened up nicely but this is kind of this open irregular crumb and this tunneling in some sections that implies that it's still underproofed. It's really close, but I think this is still a little on the underproofed side on loaf number two. Loaf number three is a more consistently proofed loaf where you can see just a better 
distribution of small, medium, and large holes throughout all four of the slices here, really through the whole loaf. And then loaf number four, we start to compress again and the loaf starts to get real dense. You see these areas of real high density in part of the crumb, which implies that it's kind of past its prime and it's heading towards overproofing. I mean, all four of these loaves are perfectly acceptable loaves and I would obviously eat any of these, but I think this really indicates how big of a difference a few minutes of bulk fermentation can have on the outcome. So for example, this first one, we fermented this for four hours. The next one was four hours and 45 minutes. So in that 45 minute time, you can really see how this opened up. Then 30 minutes after that, this big open crumb started to condense a little bit more. This is a little bit more consistent crumb, but then 30 minutes after that, so now I'm an hour and 45 minutes from where I started, I've gone too far and the loaf is now starting to compress the crumb back down again. So the real sweet spot is probably somewhere between loaf two and loaf three right here, if I had to guess. So this was four hours and 45 minutes versus five hours and 15 minutes. So maybe that five hour mark was the perfect sweet spot between the two, but that just goes to show how difficult it is to catch the bulk fermentation at really that perfect moment. So you really just have to do your best to get in the ballpark and start to be able to read the dough. Now that you've seen these images of what the slices look like, it'd be helpful to go back and look at what the dough looked like coming out of bulk fermentation. And you'll start to see some of the telltale signs of what did it look like in loaf number two versus loaf number three. And how do you spot that perfect point right between those two where you get the optimal bulk fermentation. So I just completed a taste test of the four loaves and I employed the services of an independent judging panel, also known as my wife. We both tasted the loaves and here's what we found. Going from loaf one to loaf number four, there is definitely a clear increase in the sourness of the bread as you move up to the longer bulk fermentation time. That makes perfect sense because the longer the loaf ferments, the more acid that are created through the lactic acid bacteria get permeated throughout the loaf. The long proofing, the 15 hours of, of long proofing time also can impact the overall flavor, but because we did the same 15 hours of cold retard in the refrigerator for all four loaves, that doesn't account for the difference. This is really the difference in flavor due to bulk fermentation, which is somewhat surprising. It's really a pronounced difference in the sourness of the loaves. So in this video, I really wanted to focus in on bulk fermentation, but what you realize is that as a sourdough baker, you have to understand all the stages of fermentation from the very beginning to the very end of the process. So I created this chart, which is helpful to review at this point to see how bulk fermentation really fits into the overall fermentation chain. These are what I call the five stages. So stage one is whether you choose to do an auto lease, a ferment lease, or neither. If you do an auto lease, you're conditioning the dough without starter or leaven. If you're doing a ferment lease, you're immediately starting the fermentation process as soon as your starter or leaven hits your flour and water, or you could choose not to do either one of those. Stage two is what I call kind of classic bulk fermentation when all the ingredients have been added and you're starting the process of stretching and folding and really allowing the the yeast to aerate the dough. That's really your primary rise, your first rise of the dough, and it's when you're bulk fermenting your mass of dough. Stage three is at the end of bulk fermentation, which is when we typically divide the dough. We do a pre-shaping, but we also do a bench rest and a final shaping. So there's a lot of time in that pre-shaping, bench rest, and final shaping where the dough is still fermenting. And this is a classic case where we think that when we decide bulk fermentation is done, that somehow we can stop the clock. The yeast doesn't know when bulk fermentation is done. The yeast only knows what temperature it is. And if there's still food available, the yeast keeps fermenting, whether we think it's bulk fermentation or not. So pre-shaping it's fermenting, the bench rest is fermenting, and in final shaping it's fermenting. Then when we go into stage four, which is the final proofing stage, 
you have the option of doing that on the countertop at room temperature or doing a cold retard in the refrigerator. And as I mentioned in this video, it's important to understand what your dough temperature is when you're starting that final proofing stage. And especially when you're going into the refrigerator, acknowledging that the dough temperature does not immediately go to the refrigerator temperature, that you're continuing quite a bit of fermentation, particularly during those first three or four hours in the refrigerator as the dough is starting to acclimate to the refrigerator temperature. That's really where that final proofing time happens. And then lastly, and this is often forgotten or mistaken, is that there is one last step of fermentation, and that is when the dough goes into the oven. In those first few minutes when the dough is in the oven and you're starting the baking process, as that temperature is heating up, the yeast gives its last gasp of fermentation. And that's why an underproofed loaf where the yeast goes into the oven still with a lot of pent up power in the yeast, it will significantly rise the dough and give those big tunnels and holes at the top of the dough that are the classic sign of underproofed dough because it went into the oven still with too much gas in the tank. A perfectly proofed loaf of bread is like where you fill up the gas tank at the beginning, that's your leaven in your recipe. And what you want to do is exactly run out of gas at the moment that you're pulling into the gas station, which is when you're going into the oven, you want to be on empty because you don't want all that pent up power in the yeast when you go into the oven or you get that exaggerated explosion of yeast in the first few minutes of baking that cause the holes and the tunnels in an underproofed loaf. So those are the five stages of fermentation. I find it to be very helpful to think about this picture and always understand what happened before I got to this step and what can still happen after this step. And it's really understanding that complete fermentation chain that really gives you the mindset to be a great sourdough baker. I hope you enjoyed this video. Good luck on your sourdough journey. Now I am going to eat some bread.